Hey everybody, it's Matt from East Blue Company. We're here with another uh, Facebook and YouTube live video. Uh, today we're doing a technical section on TIG welding aluminum. What you saw in just a few seconds ago, we were just setting up our cameras, welding this piece right here. Uh, if you stick around later on in the broadcast, we're gonna show you some underhood welding, which will be pretty cool. It'll show you guys exactly as we're dipping the puddle with the filler rod and uh, give you a little insight on how to get aluminum TIG welds uh, looking good. So we, if you guys haven't uh, watched one of these before, make sure you're, you're uh, sharing, you're liking, uh, commenting throughout the broadcast. We're going to be answering questions. We have Randy who also does a lot of the videos over here. He is uh, going to be shooting some questions over to me. He's also going to be answering any of your quick questions you have in the chat. So feel free uh, to, to comment and, and uh, like and share. And also we're going to be giving away one of these uh, gas lens kits here. So if you have an Eastwood welder or really any other welder, this will work for you. So we're going to, we're going to give away one gas lens kit to one person at random that shares this broadcast. So make sure you're sharing this out to your friends. Let them know that we're broadcasting and uh, hopefully they can pick up some tips along the way as well. So uh, TIG welding aluminum, uh, it's something that we find a lot of times when customers buy our TIG welders. Um, they have a ton of problems with. Sometimes people return welders back thinking that the welder is not working correctly when it's really it's just a setting that they didn't understand correctly or it was their technique. So what I'm going to try and do is show you the technique, show you what it's supposed to look like when you're welding aluminum and some pitfalls and things that I've noticed that beginners often do when they're welding aluminum uh, with a TIG welder the first time. So um, the machine here, I'll just show you a couple of the settings on here. Um, on the front here of our machine, uh, there's a power or amperage setting here. This is from where, when you're welding with a fixed, uh, with our fixed switch on the trigger. Um, otherwise, you're going to be using the pedal to vary your amperage. Now, below that, we have our preflow. And a preflow, what that is, is you have uh, a little bit of shielding gas, which is 100% argon, that flows out before it initiates an arc. So when you hit that pedal, it's going to flow out just a little plume of, air, of uh, shielding gas for a few seconds, or uh, I'm sorry, a few fractions of a second before you start welding. What this does is it gives a little cloud that keeps everything kind of clean and happy before you start welding. Uh, the other one here is what we call our clearance effect. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in depth a little more, but that's really only used for the AC side when you're welding aluminum or magnesium on the AC side. So we're going to go in depth with that, but that's basically your cleaning. Um, and then the last one here is our post flow. The post flow is uh, what it sounds like. It's, it's after you're done welding, it continues to put out a shielding gas and keeps that weld that might still be a little bit uh, molten, keeps it safe and uh, keeps any kind of contaminants in the air from getting into your weld. This is really important with aluminum welding because aluminum tends to kind of be uh, a, little, a little worse with getting contaminants. It, it takes a little longer for it to, uh, for it to stay or uh, get hard where it's not affected by the contaminants in the air. Uh, then otherwise we have our foot pedal control and our panel control. Uh, panel control is just when it's on the finger switch. And then we have our AC and our DC side. So we're going to be welding aluminum today, so we're going to stay on the AC side. Uh, now welding aluminum, the different types of aluminum, is a big thing that you need to understand. Uh, there's a number of different series, everything from 1,000 to 6, uh, up in the 6,000s you see uh, used in, I would say, in uh, common uses. There, there's some other ones that when you get into aerospace it's a little crazier. But um, the most common that you're going to see with what you're probably doing at home in the automotive use is uh, 3003 or 5000 series. If you're doing some machining and things like that, you may see 6061. Um, they all weld a little bit differently, so you need to be able to understand what each of them is like when they weld um, and how you need to set the machine up. It's going to really help you be confident when you're welding when you understand what the metal does. The other thing is, and what I run into a lot, I do a lot of old car, you know, with doing a lot of stuff with old cars, I'm welding aluminum that might be 30, 40, 50, 60, you know, plus years old, and that aluminum is going to be dirty. It's going to not, probably not going to be as high of a quality. It also may have contaminants in it 
um, that are going to make your life a little difficult. So you need to understand how to set your machine up to combat that metal. So try and understand what type of metal you're using so you can, so you can learn how to set the machine up. And uh, I'm going to give you a couple of tips along the way here that hopefully will help you um, get, your, get your machine set up and you know, a safety net so that you don't have any problems with contaminants. So after that little bit about the types of aluminum, I'm not going to talk your ear off, let's get into talking about um, clearance effect on our machine, which I think is the most important thing and oftentimes the most misunderstood with our welder. Now what we call the clearance effect on the machine here, uh, some other welders, they call it the AC balance control. Now what that is, is when you're welding aluminum, you're on electrode positive. Um, um, and when you're welding DC or steel, you're on electrode negative. So if you think of it like a sine wave when it's going up and down, your, uh, your welder is an alternating current where it's going from electrode positive to electrode negative. What does that mean to you? Well, the electrode positive, um, when it's going to it, is actually putting, let's see if we have a piece here I can show you on before we actually show you. So when you're welding, especially with aluminum, there's always like an oxide coating that gets on the metal here. Uh, and you need to have that electrode positive and electrode negative bouncing back and forth. The electrode positive is going to clean the metal, so it's going to burn off that corrosion or oxide that's on the metal. So even though if you clean this metal perfectly and I set it down and then I pick it up a couple seconds later and start to weld with it, there is corrosion that starts instantly. As soon as you put that metal down, it's going to get a, on aluminum, it's going to get a, th a thin little layer of oxide or corrosion on it. So what this is doing when it's going to the electrode positive side, it's actually burning off this oxide layer. It's giving a little area where the, uh, the arc kind of dances around and it's cleaning it. Then when it goes to the electrode negative side, it's actually putting the heat into the piece so that you can actually weld. So you can see on this piece here, this is a, a test weld we did here. Hopefully we can see that there. Um, you can see that white halo around it. So that's, that's our cleaning area. It's actually cleaning the metal um, and then our welds right down the center there. So what does that mean or how do you do that? So the clearance effect or AC balance control on our machine, we have a, a dial here that's infinite that goes from zero down to negative, basically negative six if you put it all the way down, all the way up to, to positive uh, six if you max it out. Um, the kind of sweet spot I found for most jobs is right around that negative three spot, um, negative four, somewhere in there. If the metal's nice and clean, that's a good area. Um, the more, the easiest way to remember it is the more negative that you go with the clearance effect, the more penetration you're going to get, but the smaller your cleaning area is going to be. So you need to have a uh, good uh, flow of shielding gas, your metal needs to be really clean, and your technique needs to be good as well to make sure that that shielding gas is getting right over, over the metal. Um, there is times when you're welding something, like, an old, like I come into it if I fix or repair an old car wheel, um, the metal's just dirty from, from just being run on the road for years and maybe the type of metal was used isn't as high, uh, I may have to go towards the positive side. Now, not to the positive numbers, but just towards the positive side. So I may go to negative one. What that's going to do is it's going to open up your cleaning area, but the actual amount of uh, penetration it's going to get is going to reduce a little bit. So it's always, it's, it's a kind of seesaw effect. So you have to just figure out how you can get um, the penetration that you need and also the cleaning you need. So you can combat some of that uh, by using um, a gas lens. So again, if you guys are just watching the, the video or just starting to watch here, make sure you share. We're giving away a gas lens kit. So we're giving away one of these gas lens kits, which are pretty much uh, necessary when welding aluminum. All you have to do is share. So to share this uh, live feed, and when you share that to your wall, you're going to be entered and we're going to pick one person at random to get a, uh, a TIG welding gas lens kit. So anyways, the, uh, so you need, to, you need to fight the, uh, the dirty metal 
by playing with the dial here to get it just right. So what I've done to save you guys um, watching me set the machine up a bunch and do these, we've made a, I made a piece here earlier before the broadcast where, let's see if I can get this here where you can see it. Hey Randy, do we have any questions at all? Yeah, actually, um, actually we do have a question. Owen would like to know about welding upside down. Is it difficult? Do you have any tips or would you suggest MIG welding? Okay, so Owen is asking about welding upside down if I have any tips or if it's something that uh, you should just go to MIG welding. Um, I'd actually say that, to be honest, in, in my opinion, TIG welding upside down as far as um, having an issue with the weld drooping or falling down is a little, a little easier to weld upside down uh, other than the, the taking out the aspect of using a pedal or a, a, you know, a finger switch or whatever. Uh, it's a little easier because you're welding in a smaller area, so your puddle is generally smaller and heating up uh, a, a real defined area. So you don't have that, that problem with heating up a big area where it might fall down on your droop. You're kind of moving along, and other than that little spot that you're adding filler uh, rod, that's the only time you're having, you're having uh, an issue with that. So MIG welding has its place for sure, um, but the only tips I would say is just making sure that your machine's set up correctly, and you got to be hot and fast. So you got to practice your technique so you make sure that you're, you're in and out as quick as you can. If you're sitting in one area heating up the metal, that's where you're going to have a problem where you're going to see the weld kind of fall down. Gravity is going to take over and pull the weld down, and you're going to have those issues. So it's all in technique, really. Same with MIG welding. But that's a good question. So back to the clearance effect or AC balance control. What I did here is I started from negative 6, so I have it maxed out all the way negative. You can see this little white halo is tiny. I mean, it's barely around that weld there. So I'll use this guy here to point. So, I mean, it's just barely around that. So it's barely cleaning further than the weld area. Uh, this is okay, but this is a little too far negative because, you know, you don't have any room for air. If this metal has any remnants of grease or dirt or even fingerprints, it's going to probably show up in here. So this is a brand new fresh piece, so I got away with it. Um, but generally in the real world, that's not going to work. So then I jump down to negative four. You can see this, the band gets around the outside, gets a lot better. So we're at negative four clearance effect. So that's kind of a sweet spot there, negative four, negative three. Um, they're, they're a pretty good area if the metal is nice and clean. Then we jump down to two. So we're getting a little... Uh, less penetration, but the puddle's getting a little wider and the cleaning's getting a little wider. Uh, then I jumped it down to negative half. So this is just a half. So the cleaning area is real big around here. And then our puddle's uh, penetrating uh, just fine, and it's nice and flat, but it's, it's heating up a big area on the top and the bottom here. So that's... Um, not an issue, but if you're welding something that's real crucial that you can't touch the edge or there's something next to it that just can't get burnt or melt, melted, uh, then that's where you're going to want to stick more near the, the negative four or something like that and just clean the heck out of the metal. Preheat it, um, clean it with acetone, all that type of stuff. Here, I just for fun went to positive one. So this is electrode positive plus one. That means it's hanging on that positive side for longer. Uh, what it's doing is it's putting all the heat into, well not all the heat, but a lot of the heat is going into the electrode itself instead of the piece and it's cleaning. Well, it, what happened is, um, I have the electrode here, I don't know if you're going to be able to see, but uh, this is what happened to my electrode. So I put so much heat into the electrode it just started burning away and falling off and that fell into my weld, contaminated the weld, and well, it was just a mess from there. So there's really not much of a reason that you should be using the positive side in most uh, practical applications. I haven't run across anything, at least that I've done, where I need to go that far, uh, at least with our machine. So you want to stick to that negative side. Zero you can get away with. Anything on the plus side, you're going to have that problem where it's burning away the electrode or the tungsten. It's going to fall in your piece, and then it's just going to turn into a mess, 
that's not okay. So you can really see the difference as you're, as you're doing that and it's opening up. Uh, so that's what your clearance effect or AC balance control does. Any, uh, do we have any questions about that at all or any other before I keep moving along? Um, actually, the only um, other question we've got right now is about cleaning the aluminum, which I believe you're probably going to cover, right? Yeah, yeah. Cleaning the aluminum is the next thing we're going to go over. So okay. I'm glad somebody asked about that because really, in my opinion, that's probably the number one problem that beginners have with TIG welding aluminum is uh, TIG welding in general, I should say, uh, steel, aluminum, whatever, beginners just it's way different than MIG welding. MIG welding, you can get away with burning through some crap that's on the metal, or if you have something that's got a coating on it, it'll burn through it, you can live with it, create some more sparks, but you can make a weld all right with it. TIG welding, the way I describe it is think, of, think if you're in an operating room, and that's how clean, if you can try and get yourself as close to that as you can in your own home garage, you're doing all right. Um, when you're TIG welding aluminum, you got to be really thorough on how much you clean the metal. So what I start with, I'm going to take you guys from kind of the start of the piece all the way up to where we're ready to weld. So this is a piece here um, that's brand new piece of uh, 3003, uh, eighth inch. And this has like a coating on it uh, that's put on it that kind of keeps it from oxidizing as quick. So it looks clean. I mean, if this was steel and we were MIG welding, man, we're ready to go. This is awesome. Uh, TIG welding aluminum, not so much. What's going to happen is that, that machine is going to have to burn through all those layers and it's going to probably contaminate your weld. Uh, I have, let's see here. Here's a piece that we welded in that intro section you saw next to this. You can see that it's a little more dull aside from the fingerprints. It's a little more dull, not as shiny. That's a little bit better. That's kind of what you want. So what I usually do is I take either acetone um, or what's a lot easier than having a big can of acetone laying around. I'm trying to get that just right so you guys can see the brush marks in there. Uh, if I don't, acetone's nice and does work well, but you know generally it's in a big can. It's kind of clunky. I keep our uh, Eastwood pre-painting prep around, but the key is it's the low VOC pre. That's safe to use on something that you're going to be welding. So I use, I spray the panel down with the low VOC pre, and then what I do is I take, um, I like to use these, these little scuff pads that we do sell. Um, I like using these scuff pads with the pre, spray the panel down, hit it with this, and it actually gives that brushed finish that you, that you saw on that last piece. Uh, this works well if the metal's already clean, but if your metal has uh, paint on it or a coating or something, this is gonna take forever. You're gonna have to use either a DA sander or something else to get any heavy uh, coatings off it or even corrosion. Then once you get it pretty good, I come back with this with the low VOC pre, and I hit the panel with it. Um, so we're gonna start welding with this one. I've already done the, I've gone over this one pretty quick once before. Um, and you can see the brush marks in there. It's not real shiny. So you've knocked off that surface. Um, off that surface coating. So what I do is take the uh, scuff pad. Now the low VOC pre does tend to evaporate pretty quick if, when you spray it on the metal. So what I do is I'll spray it on my, I'll saturate my scuff pad here. And then just go over the piece and you can see it's already, it evaporates real quick. So I kind of hose it on. Now we've already done this piece so I don't, gonna, I don't have to go too crazy here. But it's nice because it evaporates real fast. Um, you know, in the time it's going to take me to talk a little bit here, it's already going to be evaporated. So I'm just going to go over it, make sure any excess is off of it. Wipe it down if you have a rag. I keep a dedicated rag. Uh, I try and keep everything separated when you're welding aluminum. I keep a dedicated rag. 
I keep a dedicated stainless wire brush just for aluminum. If you start using this on a rusty piece of steel, you're just going to put those particles into these pieces and when you're wiping them down on your aluminum, aluminum softer, it's going to dig right in and you're going to have contaminants popping up in your weld. So keep a stainless brush, which is good for knocking off the heavy stuff, um, or a quick once over rag, scuff pad, all of that for your aluminum if possible. So we've scuffed our panel here. I've wiped it down with acetone. Um, the next thing is the electrode that we're using, the tungsten. Actually, before I go any further, do we have any, any other or are we good? Uh, no, actually right now we're just getting some clarifications on a few questions. We're going to have a few coming up, so we're just trying to, to make them easier for you to answer. I'm just trying to figure out exactly. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, if you guys can just, you know, don't feel free to, to add more information about your question than, than need be so we can make sure we answer it. Just tell you one. I don't want to skim over something and you still don't understand. So... The electrode or the tungsten you use, um, back in the early days of TIG welding, the electrode or tungsten, it's, well, actually let me get a better one, it's not ground here. In the early days, uh, before inverter TIG welders, uh, when there was, you had to use a specific type of electrode or, or tungsten, 100% tungsten for welding aluminum. And then when you would go to uh, welding steel or ferrous metals, you would change your, your electrode or tungsten to weld those types of metal. Uh, what, what's great about technology nowadays, as well as you know, the, the advancements in the materials, there's now kind of hybrid electrodes or tungstens that are out there that allow you to weld any material with one electrode. Um, I'm really horrible at keeping these things separated so it's quite a pain if you start uh, grinding both sides like I do just to make my life easier I grind both sides that takes that little band off so you can't tell if it's 100% if it's you know green red or what it is so what we offer is we offer the E3 which is a purple band which is here this little guy here it's got a a whole little formula there that tells you all the great stuff that's inside. I am not going to BS you guys. I do not know. I'm not a scientist. I don't know what all that formula is. Formula is, but can tell you, these things are, are really stable, so the arc doesn't wander. Uh, it keeps a nice point when you're welding aluminum, and uh, you can switch it over and weld steel. It doesn't matter. It's just a flick of the switch. Uh, you kind of do need to have a inverter welder. To also get away with that, which the Eastwood welder is. Uh, most modern TIG welders are inverter style welders, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, what this means is in the old days, you used to have to ball the tip. Uh, you used to have to set your tip on the machine. You would start a weld and it would ball the end of the tip here, and then you would start welding. It makes it difficult to keep the weld stable and small. Uh, with the new E3 and the inverter welder, welders, you can pretty much sharpen it to a point. Uh, I have it pretty much to a point here. When we start welding, it's going to flatten that point off real quick and we'll keep moving along. Or you can, you can, if you want to change your arc, you can flatten the top of it uh, to get more of a wide arc. You can change that, that radius, which I just use a belt sander over here, which we have uh, on the side here. I just use this belt sander and I put it on like so and spin my piece, my uh, electrode right on the belt sander and then you keep going. I like the belt sander just because it's uh, a little less aggressive than a, than a stone grinding wheel but there's no real proven fact that's just my personal preference. So I'm using the gas lens and I'm using a 332nd filler or uh, I'm sorry electrode today. Uh, I can also use the 116th some of the welding we did already I did with the 116th uh, the only time that becomes an issue is when you start getting into the higher amperages. Um, the 1 16th is going to start to get a little hot and may burn away. But if you're doing something that's really intricate that you can't touch any other area, um, anything around it, it's okay to use that 1 16th. You just, uh, when you, if you can't do long blasts of high amperages or it's just going to burn or drop the end of that electrode away. So I've cleaned the metal. 
with uh, scuff pad and our pre, low VOC pre, scuffed it up, wiped it down with the rag. We're pretty much ready to go here. Let's flick my welder on. Now again, we're using 100% argon. That's what you want to be using when you're TIG welding any material. So it doesn't matter if it's steel or aluminum, you want to be using 100% argon. Uh, so we have 100% argon on there. And I usually set my pre and post flows higher for aluminum. Just because they're a little more finicky, I like to give some extra uh, shielding gas. I'd rather, I'd rather have my piece turn out good than save a couple bucks on shielding gas and you have pits in your weld or have some kind of issue with your weld. So, do you have any clarification on those questions before I start doing welding? Yeah, we have a couple questions here. Sure. Um, here, I'll turn this off here. Billy would like to know if you're doing uh, multiple welds next to each other to build up a large area, do you have to change the settings on the welder, most likely due to the heat, and would you have any tips? Okay, so Billy is asking about if you're welding uh, a bunch of areas next to each other, um, if you need to change the settings on machines. So if you're filling a gap or if you have something beveled really hard, you need to put uh, a root pass down and then you need to kind of build up the area to get it flush. The settings of the machine don't really change. Uh, at that point, the metal should be pretty clean and I usually don't start and stop. So if I start filling an area, I'm just going to keep working around until I get it filled. Unless, it gets, unless it's something that can't stand the heat that you need to let cool to prevent warpage or something like that. The, the settings on the machine don't really change. Now your pedal is variable. So if you have your pedal set in a sweet spot, um, you won't really need to change it too much. I mean, if you're doing a lot of welding, obviously aluminum is like a heat sink, so it carries that heat and the amperage you need to, to uh, initiate a weld is going to be lower. So you may not need to have as much amperage. But if you have your pedal set up correctly, um, you really just, you just play with your pedal and get it at the sweet spot. So you shouldn't have to change your, your actual machine settings too much at all um, when, you're, when you're doing something like that. Uh, as far as tips go for filling a bevel or a gap, um, I've done stuff where you have to work from one edge to another. So if you have an actual gap you're trying to fill, uh, if you don't have a way to put a backer behind it, I'll work one side, put a fine little bead on one side, work on the other, put a fine little bead. Then you drop something right in the center and keep working your way up. A good thing to practice for filling gaps is weaving, where you're actually welding and weaving your arc back and forth, adding twice as much filler rod to cover twice as wide of an area. But that's a little bit more of an advanced technique. I would definitely practice that a, you know, a bunch before you start doing it on something that, that really matters. But good question. Okay, so we actually have a couple more. Oh, great. Tony has two questions. Um, one, do you have to ball the tip on the tungsten to weld aluminum? Mm -hmm. And two, will that electrode work with older non-inverter welders? Okay, so Tony was asking, uh, and I think I covered some of that probably as he might have been typing, but I'll, just to be sure, I'll go back over it. So he's asking, do we need to ball the tip of the electrode um, with, with these electrodes? And the other question was, will these work with a non-inverter type uh, TIG welder? So the first question, question is, no, we do not need to ball the tip of this uh, electrode when welding with an inverter welder on aluminum. Uh, you can ball the tip of this if you, if you choose to by changing the clearance effect or AC balance and, and setting the tip or balling it. But I don't really ever have a need to do that if I need to open up my arc a little bit. Uh, I'll put a little flat spot on the end of the, um, of the tungsten before I start welding. Um, or, like I mentioned in the last question, I like to just do a weave. I'd rather have a small, tight arc that I can control than having the bald tip on the end that's a little harder to control. I'd rather move my puddle around freely as I want and add more filler rod than having a big you know, ball on the end that I, I am stuck with, if you will. Um, will this work on a non-inverter welder? Yes, it will weld with a non-inverter welder, um, but I don't have too much experience, to be completely honest, on how it's going to react with balling or not balling the tip. Um, pretty much everything I'm probably showing my age here, everything I've used anymore is uh, an inverter welder, so I don't have anything that's, that's non-inverter. But these will weld. It's just how much you need to ball the tip or if you do need to. 
I don't have a, really have the answer on that. I'll have to play with an older machine and, and, and uh, get back to you guys. That's, that's it? All right, cool. So great questions. Remember, keep sharing the live uh, broadcast we're doing here. Uh, we're giving away a gas lens kit at the end here. So we're going to give away one of these gas lens kits to, any, uh, to one person out of anyone that shares this. So all you have to do is to share the broadcast to your wall, and then we're going to go through and look at everybody that did and pick one person at random, and they're going to get a free uh, gas lens kit. And that'll fit a Eastwood TIG or any TIG welder that uses a similar torch or the same consumables as a WP-17 torch. So that's what the, the, the uh, torch I'm using today, WP-17. If yours uses a similar size torch, then you're good to go. You, you can use that. So, got our piece cleaned. I'm going to turn this back on. Have my shielding gas turned on there. I have, oh boy, there we go. So I have our new, uh, new pedal we just came out with. I always urge you guys to give us feedback on what products you'd like to see, or if there's something you'd like to see to make one of our Eastwood products better, just feel free to email us, post on social media, um, comment on the YouTube videos, let us know. This is a perfect example. Since we've come out with our TIG welder, we had a lot of customers that said they would like um, a different style pedal as an option that's more like some of the higher dollar machines that are out there. This is our answer. We have a pedal now that just recently came out that's a uh, rocker style where you're going to put your heel in the back here and then you rock it forward. This is what's uh, more common on the higher dollar machines. It works awesome. It has the settings on the side like our other pedal that comes standard with the machine does. So you can adjust it on the fly out where you're welding instead of having, having to go back to the machine. So this is the pedal I'm using today. Uh, if you guys have an Eastwood TIG already, you can buy this separately, add it to your machine, and you're up and running. So again, feel free to give us uh, ways you think to make our, we'll make our products better, and we'll, we'll do our best to put it into production. So that's the pedal I'm using. I have it set at about uh, 100 to 130 amps max. Uh, I'm probably going to be welding a little under that, but that's about the, the spot I have it in. Where you set the pedal is all dependent on your own personal preference. As long as you can start an arc, that's all that really matters. Some people like to have uh, a third of a pedal is, is creating a puddle, and they got all that extra room to, to float the pedal back and forth. Some people like it where they're pretty much wide open throttle, and that's where the sweet spot is. So I like being a little under half. So I have a little bit of pedal to kind of goose it if I need to get a little more amperage out of the machine uh, to, to heat an area up. And then at the end of the piece, you can back up uh, to back your amperage off. So I'm going to put my, make sure my clearance effect here is kind of in the sweet spot. So I got it right around negative three in that area there. So we'll, we'll start welding over here. Um, we're going to have uh, Joe, he's on camera, he's going to come around and actually get kind of right over my shoulder. I'm going to have to stay back a little bit just so you guys can see. I'm not going to be able to see quite as well, but I want you guys to be able to see. He's going to drop a lens down, it'll go black, and then once I start welding, you'll see the, you'll see the puddle and you should be able to see what's going on here. Um, while he's getting set up, do we have any other questions or I cover them already? No, um, you pretty much covered everything. Okay, cool. There's a lot of questions about tungsten and electrodes, stuff you'd already covered. Okay. Like whether or not, like with the new purple one, can you use it for everything, which you know, went over that. Yep. And we gave them links on our page so you could go see it. Cool, yeah. Just make sure you check out in the comments section. We always drop links in of all the products we're talking about. It's going to send you right to the product page so you guys can check it. We pretty much on every one of our products now, we have a video that tells you about the product, shows it in action, and gives you more information, as well as the details in there so you can check it out. So I, I try and cover everything the best I can, but that's gonna show you the best when you go to the product page. So another little tip for cleaning. Uh, this is my 332nd. Um, filler rod that I'm using here. It's 4000 series 4041. Uh, yeah, or I'm sorry, 4043 is what we're using. So 
This is 3003 um, series aluminum. We're using a 4000 series filler rod. You want to try and match your filler rod as close as you can, if possible, to the material welding. Uh, for most of the softer aluminums, this 4000 series is going to be just fine. You're not going to have any issue. But when you start getting up into, excuse me, into some of the higher metal, um, some of the higher numbers, you may want to look into getting a different filler rod. This is what we offer: the 4043 and 116th and 332nd. But a tip: keeping it clean. I always like to hit any of my filler rod, especially aluminum, with my Scotch Brite. What that's doing is kind of the same as the metal. We're taking any corrosion or light coating that might be on the piece off. We're scuffing it up so that when you're adding that to the filler filler rod to the metal, you're not you don't have any contaminants that are on it. Um, always try and keep the tops of your tubes for your filler rod shut and screwed together. I've had times where I've forgotten to put the top on there and I went to use a piece of filler rod, especially steel, and you could actually feel the corrosion on it where it's rusting or corroding right there sitting. So unless you've got a nice climate con controlled shop, which we're fortunate enough here to have, but still, uh, you definitely want to go through and make sure you do that. So cleaned it all. Got it nice and scuffed. We'll hit the end here. I think we're good. All right. So I got this piece turned a little sideways here. Oops. Here, yeah, we'll move, move that out of the way so you guys can see. So I'm just going to run a pass diagonal here so that hopefully you guys can see um, what's going on. I'm more concerned with you guys being able to see that. So Joe's all set up and I'm going to start by initiating an arc. You can see it's cleaning that little white halo. You see the arcs dancing around like we were talking about on the electrode positive side. So now I'm going to add, goose the throttle a little more. When you start seeing it shimmer or get bright that's when we know that we're at a point where we can start adding filler rod and we see that puddle open up. So right there. I'm adding filler rod to the front of the puddle as it needs it. You don't want to hang your filler rod in the puddle because it's going to start melting off just from the residual heat on the piece. So you add a little bit and move. But you can see you got to wait for that cleaning effect to kind of catch up. Add it just to the front. And when you get to the end of the weld, I like to Put one little, start backing off, put one little dab in and move the arc over to the bottom of the puddle. Slowly letting off, slowly letting off. And then, oop, sorry. Then we're going to hold, we're going to hold the torch over the piece there and let the gas flow out. So that's where your post flow comes into uh, effect. So after you're done welding, what I try and when I was first learning is I would not flip my helmet up. Now I've gotten it down to a, I'm used to it, but when I was first learning, keep your helmet down until you hear the gas stop flowing out of the uh, torch, then you can lift it up. If you pull your hand away instantly, I did one earlier, I wanted to show you guys. If you pull your hand away instantly, are you able to, uh, no. Oops, sorry. I'm doing this on the fly. <laughs> I just want to show you guys, sorry. So if you pull your hand away instantly, what happens is you take that shielding gas away and you shock the piece. So this top one here is what we're going to try and focus in on. But you can see the end of that has a big old crater in it and has even some tiny little cracks in that. So what I did was I was welding along at the end there. I let off the pedal and took my torch away real quick and it shocked it basically. Put a little crater in it, which is starting to crack from the crater, 
If you're welding something that's structural, that's a big no-no. Those little cracks are going to open up and turn into a bigger crack and it's going to fail over time. So if you see that happen to yourself, uh, what I do is I would take a Dremel or something and try and gouge in there to get below the surface of the cracks and then re-weld and put a little dab of filler in there and melt it all together. But that's why you want to keep your hand over the last little weld there to get uh, the shielding gas to, co to coat it. Matt, what amperage were you running through that last weld before you okay. move on here? Somebody asked what uh, amperage I was welding with that last weld. So I have the pedal right now set at about like uh, 100 to 110 amps is about what, it, what it's, the max is at. But I'm dancing around the pedal probably closer to 90 or 100, right around there is where I'm, I'm playing with the pedal. So if you heard when I was welding, the pitch of the buzzing sometimes went up and down. That was me moving my pedal to give it a little more uh, amperage back and forth. But right in that range, I was right around that 90 to 100. I might have goosed it a couple of times in the beginning at a little close to 110. But um, we weren't burning through. Oh, this is hot. Who would have thought? That's but we're not burning through or anything like that, but you want to have nice penetration. We can see that it's, you know, that it was definitely penetrating through there, but uh, just play with it. There is settings on the actual machine if you guys are just starting out. If you guys are just starting out welding, uh, all of our machines, TIG welders have on the top here, they have a little chart that's kind of a starter's guide to what filler rod, what tungsten, and what amperage to run at. That's a good starting point. That doesn't mean that's the holy grail. Every piece of metal is different. It varies. So that's going to get you close. That'll get you close with your tungsten and your electrode and get your amperage pretty close. But again, where you like to run your pedal, uh, where you like it to be at, the setting on the pedal is, is kind of the max. So if I have it set to like 110, that's the max I'm going to hit. But in reality, I'm probably welding lower than that, but I have that extra juice there just in case. So I know that was a drawn out answer. Any other while we're setting up here? We have a question on YouTube. Sure. Um, which is stronger, spot welding or running a solid bead? Uh, so somebody asked if uh, on YouTube, which you can also watch this on, um, if spot welding or running a continuous bead is stronger. Uh, Pretty much 99% of the time, running a continuous bead is going to be stronger. So, but there is instances where you may only need, only can, or only need to spot weld. Spot welding is generally used in sheet metal applications, is most common where it's used um, to hold a panel together. Now, I spot, I've spot welded things together to get it fit into place and then run a bead you know, at, at the seam. But for the most part, you're, you want to run a seam. But if they're asking about sheet metal, that's what your question is kind of regarded, regarding. Sheet metal, you don't really want to run a continuous bead. If you're welding a panel together, you're going to want to jump around, or you're going to, you're going to be doing spot welds to hold a panel on, um, and that's all you may need to do when it's a floor pan or something like that. So it varies, but that's kind of the generic answer is a uh, a continuous bead is going to be stronger. Any other ones? That's it right now. Okay, cool. Uh, don't forget to share, like. We're giving away the gas lens kit here. What I'm going to do is weld. Uh, now I've laid two pieces of metal together here, and we're going to weld a puddle uh, doing a lap weld so you can, guys can kind of see how you uh, flow the two pieces together. Give you guys a little bit better of an idea so you can see what it looks like. Um, but if you have any questions, last chance to drop some questions in, last chance to share, and get yourself entered to get a free gas lens kit. Uh, let's see, oh, here we go. Uh, get a gas lens kit. This up with this. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put two little tack welds on the corners of this just to hold it together so it's not floating around. And then once I put those tack and if you think of any questions, let me. You're not 
supporting the whole weight of the torch uh, with your uh, hands. So I'm letting, the, letting it clean a little bit on both pieces and then I'm going to goose it. I probably need a little more juice there. I must have kicked my pedal because I was not getting quite enough there. So I'm going to jack that up just a little bit. All right, so we got that pretty clean. Joe's gonna come in here and I'm gonna get our filler rod we cleaned already. This is the where it gets a little difficult for us because I gotta keep my head back. But what, we like to, what I like to do is run, get your hand comfortable and do a couple test passes. Make sure you're comfortable where you're at. All right, Joe, you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm jumping back to where I tack welded just to start cleaning. So I'm going to back step into that weld and add a little dab of filler. Oops. So you must add a little bit of dirt there. Oops. And I just move my piece on me. All right, we're going to stop. I should have a, uh, we're going to flip this over. What happened is I don't have something down on this piece here, holding some weight on it. So it, it bumped as we're trying. That's why it's live. Stuff happens. So we're going to, yeah, we'll put that piece under there. All right. Hey, this is real life. This is what happens, right? You're like, crap. So, make our little teeter-totter area there. So if I was using a bigger piece, what I use is one of our sandbags, and I'll put it on the edge of a panel to kind of hold it down from moving around. Or you can use a clamp, but we need to be out in the center of the table here so that Joe can get what you're seeing, and I got to be back far enough. So normally what I would do is I'd put this close to the edge of the table, probably put a clamp on it. Obviously it's aluminum, so we can't put a magnet on there. I'm going to flip my electrode over, but this happens. All right. Let's see if I can not bump it with my hand this time. All right, Joe, you ready to come back in? Give this another try. I'm going to do uh, my little spot, my little uh, fusion welds real quick. Now let's try this again. See if I can. All right. You ready, Joe? Mm -hmm. 
down to the bottom. Let off. Hold my hand there till the, the uh, shooting gas comes out and we're good to go. So I'll show you guys that with the pliers here. I'll take the little welding lens off. So I still had a couple times where it was fighting me a little bit where there's still a little bit of contaminant or dirt in there. And what I did is I kind of just slowed down just a little bit to let that, uh, the um, cleaning effect to kind of catch up. Uh, if I was doing a test run, probably what I would do another time is I might turn my cleaning effect a little more to the negative side. So clean just a little bit better. Let me grab our piece here. So what you can see, uh, I'll set it down. What you can see is on either side, we got that cleaning, that little halo around. Up top here, I pr like I said, I probably could have turned the clearance effect, the AC balance, a little bit higher because we don't have too much cleaning up on this top edge. So if I would have turned that a little more positive, we'd get a little more cleaning up top and that probably would have stopped that, that tiny bit of contaminants that was popping on me. I think there was one right there. But you can learn to read your weld. You see brown or black spots. That means there was a little bit of contaminant in the piece where you dipped your, elect your electrode in the metal. But nothing real crazy, but just a tiny bit in there. But you can see how it laid out, nice and flat. It's nice and shiny. There's no crazy hazing or pitting in the metal. If you're seeing pitting or hazing in it, you may not have your clearance, or, uh, you may not have your clearance effect set right, maybe too far negative, or you may not have a sh enough shielding gas. You may need to turn your, your shielding gas flow rate up a little bit. But that shows you uh, just the basics for what it should look like, what it should sound like, and hopefully you can diagnose your welds a little bit. Uh, do we have any other questions that came up while we were doing that? I believe we have answered all the questions Great. for today. Great. So thanks everybody that watched, tuned in. Uh, make sure you check our website. Tomorrow we're doing a real big sale for an, an, an anniversary sale for a thank you to all our customers for all the years that have followed along and uh, bought products from us. We're doing a site-wide sale that does include welders. You're going you're gonna to get uh, a really great deal. So make sure you check in the website tomorrow. Uh, if you have any other questions or you'd like to see anything else shown live on any of these broadcasts, make sure you drop a comment in the YouTube channel, uh, username Eastwood Co. We're also on Facebook, same thing, username Eastwood Co. Drop us a line, let us know what you'd like to see, and we'll do our best to let you guys uh, check it out live on camera. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys next time.